Hi everyone, welcome to Criminality. Today we're going to be talking about the case of Jeffrey McDonald, who was convicted of killing his pregnant wife, Colette, and their two daughters, Kimberly and Kristen. Before we get started, make sure you guys hit the like and subscribe button. And if you want future notifications of when I go live or post a video, make sure you hit the bell. Here we go. On September 14th of 1963, Jeffrey McDonald and Colette Stevenson, who was pregnant at the time, got married. On April 18th of the following year, their daughter, Kimberly, was born. On May 8th of 1967, their second daughter, Kristen, was born. Jeffrey was pre-med at Princeton and graduated from Northwestern Medical School. He enlisted in the Army where he became a Green Beret surgeon stationed at Fort Bragg. And by 1970, the couple was expecting their third child, a son. By most accounts, Jeffrey was said to have been a very loving husband and a good dad. He spent time with his wife and his kids doing family things. Nobody would have suspected what was about to happen. At 3.42 a.m. on February 17th of 1970, emergency services received a call from a distraught Jeffrey McDonald. He was reporting a stabbing in his home and was requesting help. When responding, the military police found the home to be dark and the front door was locked. However, the back door was unlocked and slightly ajar. The military police walked into a horrific crime scene. As they began to investigate, they discovered Colette, who was four months pregnant, dead on the master bedroom floor. She was found on top of what appeared to be a white rug with a blue pajama top thrown over her body and Jeffrey was found laying right beside her. Colette had been bludgeoned repeatedly, breaking both of her forearms. She had also been stabbed 21 times in the chest with an ice pick and 16 times in the chest and neck with a knife, severing her trachea in two places. And the officers found the word pig written in blood on the headboard in the master bedroom. Kimberly, who was five, was found lying on her left side in her bed, and she had been bludgeoned to the point where her skull was fractured by two blows that she had taken to the right side of her head. Her cheekbone was protruding through her skin. She had also been stabbed ten times in her neck. And Kristen, who was two, was also found laying on her left side in her own bed with a baby bottle near her mouth. She had been stabbed 33 times to her head, her chest, her back, and her hands with a knife, and an additional 15 times with an ice pick. Two of the knife wounds had penetrated her heart, and the wounds on her tiny hands were determined to be defensive wounds. And Jeffrey McDonald, who was found lying next to his wife in the master bedroom, managed to survive the attack with some cuts and bruises and scratches. He had a single stab wound between his two ribs on his right side that caused his lung to partially collapse. When questioned, Jeffrey said that he had fallen asleep on the couch and was awoken by three men, two that were white, one that was black, and one white woman. He stated that the black man was wearing an army jacket that had sergeant stripes on the sleeve and that the woman had blonde hair with a floppy hat and white boots. He said that she stood there holding a candle and chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, while the three men attacked him and killed his family in their bedrooms. During the investigation of the crime scene at the McDonald's home, investigators located bloody footprints throughout the house. They found a knife underneath the dresser in the master bedroom, along with a piece of wood that was covered in blood. They had found surgical gloves that also had blood on them. And in the backyard, they found the ice pick and another knife. And the investigators took the bloody pajama top that was on top of Colette, along with a bed sheet that was also covered in blood to the lab for forensic testing. In the family room, they found it to be in shambles. The coffee table had been flipped over. Jeffrey McDonald's glasses were found underneath the window drapes. They had found blood drippings throughout the kitchen and on the phone that Jeffrey had used to call for help. And there was more blood spatter found throughout the bathroom as well. So the investigators took samples of all of the blood drippings throughout the home and sent that to the lab for testing also. 
Now, at the time of the crime, investigators used blood typing because DNA was not in the advanced stages that it is today. In an odd occurrence, each member of the MacDonald family actually had a different blood type, making it fairly easy for investigators to be able to come up with a theory on what they believed happened in the home. The blood... What's that? You mentioned the blood types. That's right. Colette type A, Jeffrey type B, Kimberly type AB, Kristen type O. Don't you think that's too confusing to a jury? On the contrary, it means that we can trace McDonald's movements throughout the apartment. On May 1st of 1970, the Army charged Jeffrey McDonald with the murders of his wife and two daughters, taking all of the evidence they had gathered from the crime scene and Jeffrey McDonald's changing stories throughout questioning to court in what is known as an Article 32 hearing, which is a preliminary hearing in the military. And after many days of testimony, the colonel in charge of the Article 32 hearing chose to dismiss the charges, stating that he did not believe there was enough evidence to further prosecute Jeffrey McDonald. This was largely based on a Fayetteville narcotics detective who stated that he actually had a confidential informant named Helena Stokely, who resembled the description that Jeffrey McDonald had given of the woman that was in his home that night. And that although she was a brunette, she did often wear a blonde wig, boots, and floppy hats. The colonel suggests that this case be reinvestigated, specifically interviewing and investigating persons like Helena Stokely before bringing charges against Jeffrey McDonald again. Jeffrey McDonald received an honorable discharge from the Army, and he chose to move to Long Beach, California, where he was running the emergency room at St. Mary's Hospital. Jeffrey seemed to enjoy the support that he was receiving in favor of his innocence in regards to the murder of his wife and children, and he decided it was time to start doing interviews with magazines and talk shows. My next guest is Dr. Jeffrey McDonald. During his interview on the talk show Dick Cavett, Jeffrey's affect was really off and everybody seemed to notice. This isn't too painful for you. Uh, my wife came home and we had a uh, before bedtime drink, really, and uh, watched the beginning of a late night talk show. He laughed at inappropriate comments. He made inappropriate jokes. He only talked about the investigation and how it was focused on him. There were people in the army who wanted a court martial regardless of any evidence. Where are these investigators now who did the uh, original? Well, most of them have been transferred. It's, it's the only way of handling things. If someone really fouls up, you either give them a medal or you transfer them. Uh -huh. and, uh... He never even talked about his wife, his daughters, or that there was actually somebody out there who was running around dressed as a hippie killing people. It was just odd all the way around. Colette's mother and her stepfather, along with Colette's brother, originally supported the innocence of Jeffrey McDonald. But as time went by, changes in Jeffrey McDonald's story just didn't add up. And Colette's stepfather, Freddie Kassab, decided to start recording those conversations that he was having with Jeffrey. And in one particular conversation, Jeffrey told Freddie that him and some of his buddies had found one of the drug-using hippies and actually killed him. This was not true. Did you get what I meant before? Yeah, I got what you meant. Uh, I didn't say anything. I got what you meant. But that's for real. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. I don't know. It didn't really change anything. And after Jeffrey's appearance on the late night talk show, Freddie Kassab was certain that Jeffrey had killed Colette and his granddaughters. And he began a mission to make sure that the world knew it also. The Army allowed Freddy to go back into the McDonald's house, which had been sealed since the crime. And what he found only solidified his feelings towards Jeffrey at this point. Drug addicts running crazy in that house, killing. Don't leave one single clue in the house. The hall closet, which was open, was full of drugs. There is not a drug addict in the world that's going to pass up hypodermic needles and, and syringes and walk out of a house. There was nothing stolen out of that house. Not one thread or not one fiber. 19 stab wounds. How does a man get stabbed 19 times and not bleed? There is not one drop of his blood in that living room anywhere. His whole story is a 
complete fabrication. You have to say to yourself, why would a man who claims to have loved his children and his wife beyond anything in this world lie about such an occurrence? And by August of 1974, a grand jury in North Carolina did begin to hear evidence against Jeffrey McDonald. And in January of 1975, he was indicted on the murders of his wife and two daughters. And Jeffrey and his attorneys filed motions stating that this was double jeopardy, that Jeffrey had already been cleared of all of these charges in the Article 32 hearing. And the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with Jeffrey and his attorneys and decided to stay the trial. And in January of 1976, all of the charges were dismissed by the Fourth Circuit Court due to the double jeopardy and speedy trial laws. After an appeal done by the prosecution, the Fourth Circuit of Appeals overturned its own decision and reinstated the charges against Jeffrey McDonald. And by July of 1979, Jeffrey McDonald's trial was set to begin. Finally. Jeffrey decides that he wants to have the rest of his court appearances and trial documented and just his story told in general. And he enlists the help of an author named Joe McGinnis, who begins to write the book Fatal Vision with Jeffrey McDonald's support. The prosecution laid out their theory that Jeffrey McDonald and his wife Colette had gotten in an argument. It's suspected that possibly Kristen had had an accident in the master bed on Jeffrey's side of the bed. Very much upsetting Jeffrey. This creates an argument between him and his wife where she potentially struck him with a hairbrush and a physical fight ensued. Jeffrey then picks up a piece of wood that is being used to prop up his bed and starts bludgeoning his wife. And they believe that during the argument that was taking place in the master bedroom, that the older daughter, Kimberly, had gotten up and walked in to see what was going on with her parents. And either on purpose or accidentally, Jeffrey had swung the piece of wood and hit his daughter, Kimberly, in the head, fracturing her skull. This was shown because Kimberly's blood type was found in the master bedroom, along with brain serum on the door frame. He took his daughter Kimberly and laid her back into her room in her bed and now thinking that his daughter is fatally wounded and his wife is most likely deceased, Jeffrey had to come up with a plan. And according to the prosecution, there was a magazine that was found in the family room that had to do with the occult, the Manson followers, and the drug use. And they believed that he took this story and made his own version. Prosecutors believe at this point that Jeffrey goes to the kitchen and retrieves his surgical gloves from under the kitchen sink and a knife and an ice pick, goes to his daughter Kristen's room and fatally stabs her to death. He then proceeds back to Kimberly's room where he ultimately stabs her as well. During this time, Colette has regained consciousness and has made her way to Kristen's room where she's trying to help save Kristen. When Jeffrey realizes that Colette is in Kristen's room, he goes in there and continues to stab her. He then takes that bloody sheet that investigators had found and uses it to bring his wife back to the master bedroom where he lays her down on that white carpet, ultimately leaving fibers from his pajamas in all three bedrooms, including under Colette's body. Prosecutors believe at that point that Jeffrey had written the word pig on his own headboard in his wife's blood. The prosecution then believes that he went into the bathroom and actually stabbed himself, seeing that his wounds were ultimately superficial and he was a surgeon, he would know where to create these lacerations on his own body without fatally wounding himself. A big part of the prosecution's theory also comes from the living room where Jeffrey said he actually struggled with multiple men at the same time who were attacking him. Yet, only the coffee table was turned over, and the magazines and items that had been on the coffee table were laying straight up on the floor with the coffee table laying on top of them, instead of the magazines being thrown about the room. The end tables, the Valentine's Day cards that were sitting on top of one of the tables, nothing else was disturbed. But Jeffrey's glasses were found under the living room drapes. And those glasses actually had the blood type of his daughter on it. How would his daughter's blood be on his glasses if he was attacked in the living room while sleeping? 
The knife that's found in the master bedroom is not considered to be one of the murder weapons. All three of the murder weapons, which was the second knife, the ice pick, and the wooden club used, were all found out in the backyard like Jeffrey had just thrown them out there. So Jeffrey creates his self-inflicted wounds, goes to call for help, and then proceeds to go back to the master bedroom and lay down by his wife and waits for the paramedics and the MPs to come. The prosecutors alleged that the motive behind Jeffrey McDonald killing his wife and children was that he wanted to be free. He did not want to be a married man. He did not want to be a dad. He did not want to have another child. And that he had been having numerous affairs that Colette apparently was aware of, according to her sister-in-law. Colette was very much alone with the children. He was an absentee father. He was an absentee husband. I don't think he was really interested in the entire venture. All he was interested in was his career. We would talk on the phone for hours, and she would just cry like a baby. And I said, what is it? And she said, he's just screwing around again. She always knew. But the defense argued that that's not true, that he had no motive to harm his family. He loved them. He wanted to have another baby. He was happy in his marriage, happy with his career. Although he wasn't perfect and had had at least one affair, he did not want his family dead. Therefore, he's innocent. And the defense argued that the MPs and the investigators that were first on the scene essentially destroyed all the evidence. The crime scene, the place where the events took place, is absolutely crucial to be preserved. More than 22 military policemen, ambulance uh, personnel, and some plain just spectators were allowed to walk through the entire McDonald House from the rear to the front, passing through the crucial scenes, and of course destroying in that process critical evidence that should have been made available. One of the MPs had actually picked up the phone receiver that had been dangling when he got there, picked it up with his bare hand, and the ambulance driver actually sat down on the couch and picked up an overturned flower pot. There was also issues with the fact that some of the fibers had been misplaced, as well as the fact that there were over 40 fingerprints from the scene that had been damaged in processing at the lab. The particular magazine that had the Manson story that they believe that McDonald had gotten his version from was tested for fingerprints, and it only had investigators' fingerprints on it. Jeffrey McDonald's were not found. But the most compelling evidence or witnesses to Jeffrey McDonald's innocence is actually one of the MPs who was first to arrive at the McDonald house. And when he testifies, he actually stated that on his way to the house, he saw a woman on the side of the road wearing a white floppy hat. You never saw a woman alone at 3.30 in the morning. That was very unusual. And to find a woman standing in the middle of that an intersection in the housing area was just totally unheard of. It never happened. And the MP's testimony led a lot of credence to the detective from Fayetteville, North Carolina, who said he had an informant that often wore a blonde wig and floppy hats named Helena Stokely. And then the defense called William Posey. William Posey was actually Helena Stokely's neighbor at the time of the McDonald murders. He testified that although Helena was a brunette, that she did often wear a blonde wig, and that after the murders, she had actually confessed that she had taken part in them. The Army had actually looked into Helena Stokely during the Article 32 hearing back in 1970, when her neighbor had come forward stating that she had confessed to him about the murders. She had told investigators that she knew she had been out that night, but had no idea where because she had taken some type of drugs and just could not recollect what she had done that evening. They wrote her off as just a drug user, basically stated that her story was not credible. So the judge that was presiding over the trial in 1979 deemed that she was not credible as well and that anybody she had confessed to was not going to be able to testify and say that she had confessed to being there or taking part in the murders themselves. Helena Stokely had made admissions to eight different people, including two law enforcement persons, about her involvement in the killings. And at the trial, 
the trial judge in an utterly astonishing and devastating ruling refused to let the jury hear of her confessions. After approximately six and a half hours of deliberations, the jury of 12 found Jeffrey McDonald guilty of first degree murder of his daughter, Kristen, and second degree murder for his wife, Colette, and his older daughter, Kimberly. He was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. Jeffrey has always maintained his innocence and the fact that he did not kill his wife and two daughters. What I remember was like thinking, my knees are gonna give way. And I was looking at the juror and I'm thinking, how, even, even with all the legs of our defense cut, how could you believe that crap? I mean, it's such an obvious fraud. It's such a fake story concocted out of whole cloth. I honestly believe that any 12 normal, rational human beings couldn't believe it, and they did. But wait, don't be fooled. That is not the end of this story. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the murder convictions in 1980 based on Jeffrey's Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial. He was released on a $100,000 bond and returned to Long Beach as the director of emergency medicine. Jeffrey was able to enjoy his freedom in Southern California until March of 1982, when the Supreme Court ruled that there was no violation of his Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial and reinstated his sentence. And Jeffrey was rearrested and brought back to prison. And remember the book that Joe McGinnis was writing, Fatal Vision, where he had Jeffrey's support and wanted Joe to tell his story of the injustice he was receiving? Well, Joe wrote Fatal Vision and actually blew everything out of the water. During the trial, the prosecutors never actually were able to prove motive beyond the fact that Jeffrey McDonald had had a few affairs with different women. But Joe McGinnis pointed out that Jeffrey had actually been taking a diet pill that contained amphetamine. Even though the prosecutors believed that Jeffrey already had a temper, these diet pills would actually enhance his anger and turn it into blind rage. This was a motive that the prosecutors did not have before. Although he had already been convicted, it didn't really matter now. It was just an interesting piece of information that was provided in Fatal Vision. Now, Jeffrey was really unhappy with the way that the book turned out and thought that Joe had basically betrayed him. And he ended up suing Joe McGinnis. It's unconscionable what's, what he's done. He has published material that is clearly false and he knows it's false. And during the civil trial, Joe McGinnis did ultimately say that the amphetamine story in Fatal Vision was pure speculation on his part. And I believe they ended up settling out of court for about $325,000. But either way, Joe wrote one hell of a story. I know that you guys are going to start thinking that this has got to be the end of this story, but it isn't. We still hear more from Helena Stokely and Helena Stokely's friends, friends, friends of friends. It gets confusing. Uh, we did a lot of opium with the cult. I was using heroin myself, but with the cult, they used a lot of uh, opium and mescaline. I had access to drugs because I was dealing them myself to support my own habit. At the time of the McDonald murders, Helena Stokely was very young and many would say she was quite impressionable. She was heavy into the drug scene as well as a self-professed cult member. She claimed that herself, along with her boyfriend Greg Mitchell and a few of their friends, one happened to be a black army sergeant, were all part of this cult and were heavy into drugs. Helena's neighbors actually remember her being fascinated with Charles Manson and what had happened with Sharon Tate out in California, and they were a bit disturbed by her fascination with the case in itself. Helena and her immediate crowd were fascinated with the thought of death, how it would be done, like with the Manson thing, the, the brutality of it. My method of handling that is to ignore it and try not to get any of the details of the blood and the gore, whereas they wanted to know exactly how many times she was stabbed, which blow would have killed the baby, how long did the baby live. They were just every intimate detail they could get of that gory stuff, they were fascinated with it. Many of the people that had returned from Vietnam at the time were leaning towards drugs to self-cope and self-soothe. 
and quite a few of them were overdosing and ending up in the hospital, which is where Jeffrey McDonald came into the picture. He was very much against drug use and didn't really treat the patients that were coming in, like patients, much more as if it was their own fault that they were in this situation and almost like he was disgusted with the fact that they had done this to themselves. I was sort of looking upon drug abusers as sort of wasted members of society needlessly. Personally, I hadn't yet reached that uh, total acceptance of the drug problem as a real medical urgent need at that time. I was more like, straighten up your act. You know, this is partly on you, son. The role of an army physician is to keep the troops ready for an armed emergency where, where firearms have to be used in a hurry and someone else's life may be at stake. Communications between an army physician and a soldier on duty were not privileged. On the one hand, he was trying to do what was best for the patient, and on the other hand, he sort of had some duty to report that drug abuse to a superior officer. I do recall several cases where I notified commanding officers. This became an issue in the community of the drug users because they felt that Jeffrey McDonald was not there to help them, and they just didn't like him because he wouldn't provide them the methadone that they needed to be able to either stay high or come off of the drugs. And Helena had confided in her neighbors about the issues that her and her friends were having with Jeffrey McDonald. She told me that, you know, the guy had went to him about his problem, you know, and that, uh, that he was on drugs and to get help for it. We would simply discussed the fact that he was giving us a hard time and that someone did have to have a talk with him. And they were just gonna rough him up a little or something like that, and things got out of hand. Years later, she still told the same story to detectives on other cases that she had talked to and friends that she had come across throughout the country. She uh, stated very clearly that, uh, that there was a, a group of people there in Fayetteville that hated Dr. McDonald. And because I know she made a statement one time that said you and him would probably liked each other because both of you were against drugs so strongly. They went to his house that night and uh, proceeded to kill the family. And their the reasoning for wounding him was to let him know that uh, they could have killed him, but that the way to kill a person is to do it inside do it mentally and not physically to let him know that they could have killed him but they did it through killing his family they killed him basically inside and remember the detective from fayetteville north carolina that helena was a confidential informant for he says that he actually knew of the issues that her and her friends were having with the doctors such as jeffrey mcdonald regarding their treatment he says that she was actually one of the best cis he had ever had and although he knew she was on drugs he probably arrested over 500 people just due to her information. So he had no issue overlooking her own personal drug use. But most importantly, he actually says that he saw Helena Stokely the night before the murders at about 1030, getting out of a blue Mustang, wearing a white floppy hat, her boots, and a blonde wig. And she's accompanied by a few of her friends, including her boyfriend and the sergeant that he is all too familiar with because he has seen them together on many occasions. She was dressed with a pair of white boots and a wide brim hat on, wearing a wig, a blonde wig, had sort of a mini skirt on. The black man was dressed in an army fatigue jacket on with these six sergeant stripes on it. There was a white male in the, in the right front seat and I believe it was Greg Mitchell. Around midnight, Helena Stokely says that she took a drug called mescaline and that her and her group of friends actually headed to a Dunkin' Donuts. This was confirmed by other people at the location who said that they witnessed Helena and her friends leaving a little after one and actually heading towards Fort Bragg. And at about 2.30 a.m. in an intersection near the McDonald residence, another officer's wife, Shirley Cole, says that she actually spotted the car and recognized Helena Stokely. Coming up on the red light, I was stopping for the red light beside the road was this car a 1964 ford mustang what with color dark blue she had a dress so a dress on 
high top boots, a white hat, broad brim, white hat, long hair. And Helena's neighbor says that he witnessed her coming home at about four o'clock in the morning in a blue Mustang. I went to the front door and, you know, sat there and watched them, you know. And I remember Helena getting out and going to the house. It was, it was definitely the Mustang. Big hat she had on her hat, you know, the big floppy hat. Uh, with the lighting situation like it was, uh, I couldn't give any other details. Now, the guys all had on their usual field jacket garb. And the neighbors say she was with her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell. Helena also says she was riding in a blue Mustang that night. Well, there was two different cars. One was a blue Mustang, one was a yellow Plymouth. That evening, I was wearing a blonde wig as a joke that belonged to my roommate and a floppy hat. I had on a black skirt and I'm not sure what type of blouse and boots. And during the morning hours of February 17th, a waitress from a drive-in restaurant stated that she saw Helena and her group of friends and Helena was wearing the white floppy hat and the boots and actually approached her and asked her if she had heard that the McDonald family had been murdered. And when she told her that she hadn't, she noticed that there was some discoloration on Helena's boots. She held her hat to make sure she didn't lose her hat. And I noticed she had a floppy type hat on. And um, she said, did you know Mc Mc McDonald's family were killed and that he might die too? And I said, no. She had on boots and they were smeared like with blood, white boots, sort of like an off-white boot. It was um, red and smudgy outline of red. And when the detective from Fayetteville asked her if she knew or had heard anything about the McDonald murders, her response was, yeah, I think I was there. I think I witnessed the whole thing. She tells him that one of the things that she actually remembers from being in the house was that she tried to ride a horse, but the horse was actually broken. Her neighbors said when they heard Jeffrey McDonald's description of his assailants, they thought of her immediately and asked her if she had taken part in it. We got into conversation about murder and I point blank asked her, you know, was she involved in it? You know, I said, well, did you do it? And her remark to me was that all she did was held the candles, you know, that, that she didn't participate in any of the killing. The TV was on, but it was off the air. Dr. McDonald was laying down on the couch. He apparently had been reading something because the book was turned upside down on him and his reading glasses were on the coffee table. Then someone went into the bedroom Colette was laying there with one baby. And when it got out of hand, I just wanted to get out of there. Greg Mitchell was in the bedroom then. I walked out, went into the other bedroom, and there was another baby in there. And I backed up against a rocking horse. And it was broken. I noticed the spring was broken on it. When we were in the living room, I just screamed, uh, acid is groovy, kill the pigs, hit him again. She then says that the phone actually rang, and they answered it. Someone asked for Dr. McDonald, and everybody started laughing and everything because we were all on drugs. And what's even crazier than Helena's stories is the fact that there is a gentleman that comes forward and says that he did call Jeffrey McDonald's residence that night because he was looking for his own doctor, Dr. McDonald, and the hospital had given him the wrong Dr. McDonald's phone number. And his story is that somebody answered the phone, was laughing, and that a guy in the background said to hang up the goddamn phone. And when I called the hospital, I asked for Dr. McDonald. I didn't specify the first name. I said, let me speak with Dr. McDonald. And uh, they told me it was not on call that night. The lady answered the phone. She was uh, said hello and was laughing hysterically. Like, you know, she was drunk or could have been high or whatever, I don't know. I just started laughing, and they said, hang up the phone. So I hung up the phone. Then a voice, a male voice behind said, hang up the goddamn phone. And they, all I know is the phone went dead. I don't know if it was snatched out of the wall or hung up or, that's, that's all I know. She even mentioned to her neighbors that she thought she had been spotted by an MP when she was leaving the crime scene. And remember, there was an MP who said he saw a woman with a floppy hat on the side of the road on his way to the McDonald residence. 
remember she told me a police, uh, MP car had passed by or if I remember right, there was something about an MP car or something, and she felt like she had been spotted, you know, and she was real concerned about it. She was real worried about it, you know. After Helena's multiple ever-changing stories, the defense wanted her to testify at Jeffrey's trial. She had one request. She wanted blanket immunity, and when they could not give her immunity, she decided that she was going to go back and revert to the, I'm just a drug-addicted hippie who doesn't really remember anything about the night of February 17th. Her friends wanted her to testify and to set Jeffrey free if she had actually committed this crime or been there during the commission of this crime. But she said, why would she give herself up? I'm just going like normal, just like Helena they expect to be there. And just a, you know, a, a half crazy drug head and, and uh, all I, you know, they'll just excuse me and I'll walk away smiling, laughing. She's a smart girl. I said, we, we have a man here that's possibly innocent. And if he's innocent, he certainly don't deserve any other thing except being set free. And uh, she said, well, what used me to go in and put myself in jail and let him go? I'm not going to do it. I'm too smart for that under him. It turned out exactly the way she said it would. The, you know, uh, they just said, uh, you're excused. Can't put no reliability in what she says at all. Helena would continue to do multiple interviews, mostly with the private investigator that Jeffrey McDonald had hired named Ted Gunderson and her handler from the Fayetteville Police Department, Detective Beasley. Her stories would still change, but she would claim that she was changing her stories based on fear for her own life and that she was receiving threats over the years. Yes, sir, because at the time of the murder, I was involved with a satanic cult. Uh, since then, I've been contacted. I'm now pregnant. Uh, anyone who knows anything about witchcraft knows the firstborn child can be sacrificed and will be. Uh, I've been threatened. Um, threats have been made on me, my family, and everyone else. You don't have to believe me. I'm just trying to keep an innocent man from being in prison. If the uh, FBI or someone would check out everything, they would find out that Jeffrey McDonald is an innocent man. Unfortunately for Jeffrey McDonald, nobody believed Helena Stokely and nobody believed him. Helena ended up passing away in 1983 due to her drug and substance abuse issues. But Helena was not the only one who made confessions about that fateful night in February of 1970. Remember her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell? Over the years, he had confessed to multiple people that he had been there at the crime scene that night and had played a role in the deaths of the McDonald family. Greg Mitchell was also addicted to drugs and alcohol and shortly after the McDonald murders had actually checked himself into a rehab facility to hopefully get clean. The man was in a terrible state. He really was, Chris. He needed help so badly. And he confessed that he had taken the lives of a woman and two children. And he wanted, to, he wanted God to forgive him. He wanted to be forgiven. And he wanted help. We went into the first room, and it was empty. And we went into the second room. And across the wall was where the person who had been there, Greg Mitchell, had written in blood, I killed. McDonald's wife and children. It was in three lines across the wall. Mm -hmm. It was in blood. They, they found an animal in the backyard. I don't know what it was, but an animal had been killed and was in the backyard, and evidently he had used the blood from that animal. He said that they didn't mean to kill anybody. They had just went there to get even with McDonald's for getting them in some kind of trouble over some drug something about drugs. and. Uh, that uh, things went bad after he got on the inside. He said he just had to get some money and he had to get out of it. He might even have to leave the country. And I said, well, Greg, don't worry about it. If you didn't do anything, you don't have anything to worry about. And Greg said, well, that's just it. I did it. I'm guilty. Because for years, something had bothered him really, really bad and it really upset him. You could tell that Greg was a tortured human being. And Greg Mitchell ultimately passed away in 1982 due to his drug and substance abuse issues. 
By 1989, Jeffrey's attorneys and his private investigator Ted Gunderson believed that they had enough evidence with the interviews of Helena and the people that she had confessed to along with the people that Greg Mitchell had confessed to. They believed that Jeffrey McDonald had a good chance of getting a new trial. They had also requested all the FOIA documents from his trial 10 years prior. In the FOIA documents that they received, they actually found quite a bit of evidence that it seemed the prosecutors potentially had suppressed during his trial. The documents showed that during the early investigation that there was a lab technician who had actually tested a synthetic hair that was found at the crime scene. This gave the defense the idea that that hair could potentially be from a blonde wig that Helena Stokely said she was wearing. During the trial, the prosecutors had stated that two of Jeffrey's pajama fibers had been found on the wooden club, which was important because it tied Jeffrey directly to the murder weapon. In the FOIA documents, though, it was stated that the Army had initially decided that those were pajama fibers, but when the FBI re-examined the evidence, they actually said that they were made of black wool, which did not match Jeffrey's pajama top. Similar fibers were actually found on Colette's body, and these fibers could not be matched to anything in the McDonald home. The report also showed that there was unidentified human hairs that were found underneath the fingernails of Kimberly and Kristen. Nobody mentioned any of this evidence to the defense team, nor was it mentioned during trial, so the jury never actually got to hear of any of this. If this evidence is heard by a neutral jury, then I will be vindicated. All I need is a trial. And based on all of this evidence, Jeffrey's attorneys tried to get him a new trial twice, once in 1990 and once in 1997. To no avail, Jeffrey was not given a new trial. Jeffrey and his attorneys continued to try to appeal and get this verdict overturned and get Jeffrey free based on the evidence. He was up for parole multiple times and refused to admit any form of guilt, so he was turned down by the parole board. In 2020, he applied to the court to be granted compassionate release and was denied, although he tried to appeal that but ended up dropping it. This case is known as one of the most litigated cases in history. But Jeffrey McDonald is still serving his three consecutive life sentences behind bars, although he has been married now for quite a few years and got to move from a California prison to a North Carolina prison so he could be closer to his wife. And although it's been over 50 years, Jeffrey has always maintained his innocence and says he did not hurt his wife or his girls. As I was saying that this case is one of the most litigated cases in the U.S. history. So there's a lot of appeals and a lot of court documents that I was unable to share, otherwise this video would just be 10 hours long. And I know that this case isn't popular, it's not a trending case, it's not something that's going to have everybody watching it, but it's a case that's always been very important to me. There's something about Colette and Kimberly and Kristen that's always been very close to my heart, and I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch this. It means the world to me to have each and every one of you be subscribed to this channel and to care about the victim's stories the way that I do. So I just appreciate each and every one of you, and thank you for being here. I'll see you next time.